first slide. So throughout human history, we've sought to stem the tide of aging and disease, but the fountain of youth has been quite elusive. And uh, as I know as a physician, we will hear about amazing technologies. We throw drugs, devices for the lucky few who get off the transplant list, transplants, uh, implants, et cetera, but they really actually are curative. There's a new sea change, I think, a paradigm shift in medicine that's occurring, and that's the field of regenerative medicine, which I'll define as the ability to repair, replace, restore, and regenerate tissues that are damaged by aging, disease, and trauma in new, exciting ways that I think are going to cut across the healthcare spectrum and affect the unmet needs of our aging population and uh, the healthcare economy. Now, the stem cell field is highly associated with regenerative medicine. It's particularly exciting because stem cells, in general, have the ability to turn into, have the potential to turn into many different sorts of tissues. Now, there are different types of stem cells. Just a little bit of stem cells 101. Embryonic stem cells are thought of as pluripotent because a single embryonic stem cell has the potential to turn into one of over 200 tissue types that you have in your body. However, those have not even yet started clinical trials. Adult stem cells we've now discovered in multiple tissues in our body. Neural stem cells, those of our skin, uh, newly discovered heart stem cells, and of course those in our bone marrow that regenerate our blood system every day. Now, what makes a stem cell a stem cell? Well, it has to have two key criteria. Number one, it has to be able to self-renew, regenerate itself. And two, it has to have the ability to differentiate and form mature tissue. So for example, the blood-forming stem cell, hematopoietic stem cell, can form all the red cells, white cells, and blood cells of your immune system. But the stem cell field has been ripe with the field of hype. Uh, I think it's in, in some sense the new sort of snake oil. You can go around the world today and, and get stem cell therapies from hangnails to wrinkles to cerebral palsy, and it, at worst, uh, or at best, they take a lot of, cost a lot of money, and at worst, they're uh, unproven and, in many cases, unethical. And I think the stem cell world has followed this sort of hype curve where we've had a technology trigger. It's only been 11 years since Jamie Thompson cloned the first embryonic stem cell line, a peak of inflated expectations, and now a trough of disillusionment. However, I think now we're starting to enter this realm of enlightenment and plateau of productivity. It's a brave new world. And we're lucky to have new institutions like International Stem Cell Society of Research, uh, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, funded by Californians, and a slew of new uh, regenerative medicine institutes at major institutions across the country that are starting to approach this field of regenerative medicine. Now, it's really a multidisciplinary field. It's not just stem cells, which I'll focus on in my talk, but it's also tissue engineering, regenerative compounds that can turn on our own endogenous stem cells, the ability to screen new drugs using stem cell technologies, and of course, aesthetic medicine to address the double public health scourge of male pale baldness and mammary apenia. So we're getting to the important things. So what's the reality of where are stem cells today? So my clinical field is bone marrow transplantation, which is a form of stem cell therapy we've been doing for over 40 years. Blood-forming stem cells are very rare. We find them in the marrow. They're less than one in 1,000 cells. They can reconstitute the blood and immune system. There are also mesenchymal stem cells and progenitors in the marrow cavity, which can turn into fat, muscle, neural tissues under the right conditions. These were uh, blood-forming stem cells were the first stem cell that were identified and isolated 20 years ago at Stanford by my mentor, Irv Weissman, and colleagues, first in mouse, then in humans, we can identify markers on these cells, sort these cells out individually, and show that they act as stem cells. In this example, we can take a single blood-forming stem cell, put in the gene from a firefly so it actually glows, transla transplant that into a single mouse that's received radiation, and we can track where that stem cell has gone over time, and it can reconstitute the entire blood and immune system of that mouse in about two to three weeks. We know there are still stem cells in that mouse because we can take bone marrow from that same mouse, and transplant it to three more recipients and reconstitute the entire blood supply of these mice. So that's an example of a stem cell in action. Now, how do we use this clinically? So we've been doing bone marrow transplantation primarily for the severe malignancies like leukemia and lymphoma, where the patient will receive high-dose chemotherapy and radiation in an attempt to not get any residual tumor cells, but will also completely destroy their own blood-forming stem cells. So we'll take a healthy donor, ideally a brother or a sister, and infuse them with healthy marrow-containing marrow stem cells. This usually requires chemotherapy and radiation. We're now applying this field to treating genetic disorders and autoimmune, uh, autoimmune problems. However, particularly in children, which I treat, we want to avoid radiation and chemotherapy. And in a recent publication uh, we published in Science, we, uh, to, together with colleagues, including Anishka Chekowitz, a talented MD student at Stanford, we've found that we can take antibodies to attack the unhealthy stem cells of the bone marrow, remove those, without radiation or chemo, infuse healthy stem cells and reconstitute the immune system, in this case, of a mouse, but we're moving on to do this in the human system. 
But all, not all stem cells are good stem cells. Um, one of the worst things as an oncologist is when a patient has a relapse, sometimes months or years after, uh, after completing very rigorous therapy. And it turns out in many tumors, they're actually cancer stem cells. If you think of a cancer like a weed here, if we take a weed, we hit it with a weed whacker, we big dose guns of chemotherapy and radiation, very toxic, we often shrink the tumor, it seems like it's in remission, but we leave the roots, the, the cancer stem cells remain and the weed regrows. We're learning now that we've been targeting the wrong cells. Cancer stem cells in many cases are actually chemo and radiation therapy resistant, and those are what come back and reconstitute the tumor and relapse and metastatic disease. We need to now identify the cancer stem cells so that we can target them and end up with long-term cures in a much less toxic manner. So several groups, academic and companies, are now identifying these cancer targets on many different types of tumors, um, and these are now just going into clinical trials. A company called Oncomed has a targeted antibody therapy, which is starting therapy this year for metastatic disease. So where else is the reality of stem cells today? In regenerative medicine, there been many folks, dozens of trials now, trying to take the adult stem cells from the bone marrow and apply it to, for example, cardiovascular disease. In dozens of studies now, uh, we've taken bone marrow from a patient, let's say, after a heart attack, and in infused that or injected into the area of infarction in an attempt to improve function after a heart attack. This is a double-blinded trial published in New England Journal of Medicine where the patient, about a week after a heart attack, a major heart attack, had bone marrow cells harvested, infused down the coronary artery, and in the treatment arm, they had a 7.5% improvement in their ejection fraction, their ability to pump blood, where the control group only improved slightly. And this went on to have both clinical uh, outcome measures, such as more longevity and, and less readmission rates, et cetera. So um, how, how does this work? The initial thought was maybe marrow stem cells were turning into heart muscle or into brain tissue. It doesn't seem to be the case. In the setting of cardiovascular therapy, marrow-derived stem cells seem to, to stimulate new blood, blood vessel formation or angiogenesis. And here's an example actually in lower leg peripheral vascular disease where marrow-derived cells are vastly improving um, and saving limbs from being amputated. But ultimately, we don't want to just squirt cells into the heart. We want to have functioning heart patches and recreating organs. This is an example of now adult stem cells from human hearts that can beat in vitro. The challenge now is how to integrate these into an actual heart. And our next speaker, Tony Atala, who's a master of tissue engineering, will describe how we're starting to integrate cells and tissue engineering to recreate organs um, to make even better therapies into the future. We're using adult stem cells to apply to major neurodegenerative disorders, such as Parkinson's. We can take those mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow and now push them into producing dopamine, which can potentially treat uh, Parkinson's disease. It's in, in preclinical trials. Um, adult stem cells have been identified in fetal and human adult brains, which can now be expanded massively ex vivo. And these neural stem cells have the ability to turn into neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, all the components of the brain system and have now just finished their first phase one trial in a study by Stem Cells Inc. in Batten's disease. So the first trial is done, and others are, are on, the, on the books to try and address stroke and spinal cord injury with adult stem cells. Uh, there are nice animal models now for Alzheimer's, where neural stem cells in animal models so far can ameliorate the symptoms and even reverse uh, the pathology of Alzheimer's. So if we want adult stem cells, where do we actually get them? Bone marrow? Core blood, one shot time, shot one shot deal, even with liposuction, fat is a rich source of mesenchymal stem cells. Now, when I was a bone marrow transplant fellow at Stanford, I spent a lot of time in the operating room harvesting bone marrow. And we need about a liter of bone marrow to get out, uh, have enough stem cells for a transplant. And the way we do that really hasn't changed in 40 years. We take a, a, a large trocar like this and put it into the rear end of our donor or patient. And, uh, it takes about 200 punctures to get out that liter of bone marrow. And I was doing these procedures, and my arm was getting tired. I was getting calluses, let alone the patient, the donor, who's often a volunteer, whose rear end looks like Swiss cheese at the end of the, of the day. And I thought, you know, there's got to be a better way uh, than this arcane procedure. And I came up with a device we call the marrow miner. And this device, which I'll demo later if anyone wants it, um, works like this. Instead of entering the bone marrow cavity dozens of times under general anesthesia, we can enter just once. We have a flexible rotating shaft, flex shaft with a wire loop tip that stays inside the marrow cavity. As it moves to the marrow cavity, it follows the contours of the hip and can aspirate very rich concentrated bone marrow through a single puncture as an outpatient basis under local anesthesia. Um, and in so doing, abrogate the cost of OR and make it easier for the donor and get more stem cells out, which will help the, the recipient. Now, we've uh, developed this as a spin-out from Stanford and a company called StemCore Systems. In our early preclinical work, we found that we get 10 times more stem cell activity from the marrow miner compared to the standard trocar approach. 
Um, this has now been FDA approved and CE marked, and we've completed uh, human trials, and you can see here in action, fluoroscopy, where the device has been done on local anesthesia, we get at richer bone marrow cells, um, and uh, uh, an easier time at, at harvest. So we're now commercializing the product. This is Merrimeyer 2.0, and the hope is this will enable us to have better outcomes, make it easier for donors, encourage people to sign up to be a bone marrow transplant registry donor, may enable you to even bank your bone marrow stem cells now if you want them for the future. Um, I'll briefly also mention, we don't only need to harvest stem cells, we need to process them and deliver them. And we're also working on targeted delivery technologies, for example, ways to better get cells into the pancreas, for example, if you wanted to deliver cell therapy to the pancreas. An important aspect of stem cells is the environment in which they grow, and that is the stem cell niche. So in, in some work we've been doing at Stanford, we've developed a new model studying this environment, which affects stem cell fate and differentiation. Um, together with Charles Chan and colleagues, we published this year in Nature, that we could take a small fetal bone, which contains no marrow, transplant that underneath the kidney capsule of an adult mouse, and it would grow over ten tenfold. If we then looked inside that marrow cavity, it would be full of the adult stem cells from that recipient mouse. We've essentially re-engineered a bone marrow cavity in a place that never exists under the bone marrow cavity. We can actually now sort cells from those fetal bones and recreate an entire bone marrow cap underneath the, under the, underneath the marrow cavity, and have found very specific populations that only form, bone, only form the bone marrow niche, only form bone, or only form cartilage. And the hope is that we can take this forward for clinical use to treat orthopedic diseases, et cetera, and maybe even make an out-of-body ex vivo bioreactor to make red cells and platelets instead of having to donate blood in the, in the clinic. So where's the future going? Where's the hope of stem cell biology? A lot of that has been around embryonic stem cells. Let's just remember where they come from. These come from eight, about five to six day old blastocysts, usually discarded from in vitro fertilization clinics. They're smaller than the period at the end of a sentence or the, the eye on a dime. And what we can derive from these six day old blastocysts is from the inner cell mass, this embryonic stem cell lineage. Now, we never want to actually use the embryonic stem cells themselves as a therapy because those cells can turn into any tissue. They'll form tumors called teratomas. We need to learn what the special sauce is. How do you differentiate these cells to form liver hepatocytes, kidney cells, heart muscle, uh, insulin-producing cells? And a lot of what the field of regenerative medicine and stem cell biology is doing is trying to describe how to do that in a complete ma manner. We don't want to have even 1% contamination with embryonic stem cells if we're going to use them therapeutically. It's only this year that Geron just received uh, approval to start the very first clinical trial using embryonic-derived stem cell, uh, stels, oligodendrocytes, that can make myelin coating on damaged neurons. That's just been approved and hopefully will start uh, within the year. Other examples of embryonic stem cells are to create the beta islet cells that make insulin. And Big Pharma is getting into this. Pfizer is working with the local company, Novacell, to make embryonic stem cell-derived uh, beta islet cells, macular de degeneration for blindness, and others are coming down the pike. Now, the problem with embryonic stem cells, though, however, they're not coming from you. They're from another individual. They're not immunologically identical. So if I were to receive a heart graft from um, cardiomyocytes from embryonic stem cells, I'd likely reject it, just like I would an organ transplant today, and I would need lifelong immunosuppression. So one of the strong interests of the field was how can we make personalized stem cells, stem cells that were identical to the patient, which would enable them to have personalized therapy. And that brought about the field of therapeutic cloning. Now, the concept here is that we could take donor eggs from a, a healthy young donor woman, remove the nucleus from those eggs, and replace those with the nucleus from an embryo from a patient, from a skin cell, for example, and create potentially a complete embryonic stem cell line derived from that patient to have a very specific therapy. Now, clearly that has ethical and political overtones I don't have time to discuss today. But suffice it to say, people get more interested in embryonic stem cell therapy when they think it might apply to them or their loved ones. But if you think about it, the skin cell on the tip of your nose and the embryonic stem cell line that you were when you were six days old have the exact same DNA. It's a, it's a, it's a question of reprogramming those cells. How can we turn on the stemness genes to actually make an adult cell act like an embryonic stem cell? And that's exactly what's happened in the last three years in this field. Shin Yamanaka out of Japan three years ago blew away the stem cell world by describing the ability to take a skin cell and reprogram it with only four genes and turn those essentially into pluripotent, induced pluripotent stem cells that have the ability to turn into all of those 200 plus tissues. Now the problem here is that this was first done in mice and very quickly by, uh, by others in humans. Uh, with human cells, is that th this required viral vectors, viral vectors to transplant these uh, genes in, which are potentially not useful clinically. So what's happened recently, work out of Kevin Egan's lag at Harvard and others, 
just published last month is to take small molecules, basically drugs, that can take these fibroblasts and convert them in a very quick manner into these pluripotent stem cell lines. Now, how are we going to use these clinically? If you're a patient, I, I won't guess how many years, but once we get the, through the FDA process, you'll be able to donate some skin cells, simple biopsy. We'll reprogram those cells with nuclear reprogramming. You'll have your own pluripotent stem cell line, which we can differentiate into the cell type you need to treat your disease. And very importantly, if you're a patient, for example, with Lou Gehrig's disease, we can actually generate the motor neurons from you, the patient, and study them in the test tube to identify new drug targets and potentially screen you for the most appropriate therapy, as well as understand the biology of, of this devastating disease and others. And I would postulate, just like we can bank cord blood today, in the future, you'll actually be able to bank and create your pluripotent stem cell line ahead of time. If you have genetic abnormalities, you can create those, uh, you can fix those. And We'll go on to actually generate in the test tube new heart patches, neural cells, hepatocytes that you can freeze away and bank for the future when and if you might need them. So stem cell therapy is saving lives today. In my clinical field of oncology and bone marrow transplantation, we're saving lives. These are our bone marrow transplant survivors that come together at Stanford every year. And I think with the rapid advances and progression of this exciting field, stem cells and beyond in regenerative medicine, we're going to be able to um, halt the ravages of aging and cure many diseases and suffering into the future. Thank you very much.